Hello, welcome to Biology with Risa. In this lecture series, we will be looking at the male and female reproductive system. I am going to divide this lecture series into five videos. Part one will look at the development of male and female sexual characteristics. Part two will look at male and female reproductive anatomy. Part three will look at gametogenesis, or in other words, the formation of sperm and eggs. Part four will look at the hormones involved in the female reproductive cycle. And in part five, we'll briefly talk about infertility and contraceptives. In this video, I will be talking about the development of male and female sexual characteristics. Let's first talk about how we can biologically distinguish males versus females. One thing that you could look at is the type of gametes produced. Males typically produce sperm, females produce eggs. However, I do want to bring up some exceptions such as individuals that have genetic or environmentally caused abnormalities that prevent the production of sperm or eggs. So this means that some males might not be able to produce fertile sperm and some females may not be able to produce fertile eggs as well. A second characteristic that we can use to distinguish males versus females is genetics. In humans, we have 22 pairs of non-sex determining chromosomes, or in other words, these are called autosomal chromosomes. And you can see them pictured here for a male, and you can see them pictured here for a female. However, we also have one pair of sex determining chromosomes. Males will have a Y chromosome, so they will be XY. Notice the X chromosome is long, and the Y chromosome is very short. Females, however, lack the Y chromosome. So females typically will have two X chromosomes. And so they have two of the longer chromosomes here. However, again, I want to bring up some exceptions. Some individuals have genetic defects that prevent the Y chromosome from working. So in other words, the Y chromosome is not expressed. So they may have the Y chromosome, but it's not functional in their body. There are also situations where individuals have extra or too few sex chromosomes, and I will talk about those later in this video. The third characteristic that can be used to distinguish between males and females is the presence of specific organs and genitalia. Males typically have testes and a penis, whereas females have ovaries, a uterus, and vagina. However, I do want to point out that the presence of ambiguous genitalia in some individuals is possible, and I'm going to bring up some examples of how this can occur later on in this lecture video. The fourth characteristic that can be used to distinguish males versus females is the amount of certain hormones found in the body. Males tend to produce a lot of what we call male sex hormones, or in other words, androgens. And an example of an androgen would be testosterone. Females, on the other hand, produce a lot of what we typically think of as female sex hormones. And what you see in higher levels in females are estrogens. Estrogens are actually a group of hormones. And one type of estrogen is estradiol. Um, another type of sex hormone that typically is really high in females is called progesterone. However, I want to point out again that hormone levels can vary among individuals. Also, some people may lack receptors for specific sex hormones. For example, somebody who is genetically male may produce testosterone, but not have the receptors for testosterone, and therefore their body does not react to testosterone. In cases like this, those individuals may actually develop female sexual characteristics. In addition, females normally produce small amounts of testosterone, and males normally produce small amounts of estrogen and progesterone. So therefore, hormones that are considered male sex hormones are also found in females, and those that are considered female sex hormones are normally found in males, and they also do have some role in the physiology of males as well. Before we move on, I wanna talk about how we can categorize sex organs and sexual characteristics. Sex organs can be divided into what we call primary sex organs and secondary sex organs. Primary sex organs are organs that produce gametes. Gametes are also called sex cells. 
Um, they're also called in males sperm or spermatozoa, and in females, gametes are the eggs. Um, and other words for eggs are ova or secondary oocytes. The primary sex organs, therefore, are the gonads because the gonads are what make the gametes. So in males, these would be the testes, and in females, these would be the ovaries. Secondary sex organs are other organs that are essential for reproduction, but are not the gonads. So in males, this would consist of a system of ducts to transport the sperm. It would also consist of a group of glands that are essential in creating semen, and as well as the penis. In females, this would include structures like the uterine or fallopian tubes, which transport the egg as well as the uterus and the vagina, all of which are essential in reproduction. Sex characteristics can also be divided into primary sex characteristics or secondary sex character characteristics. Primary sex characteristics are characteristics present at birth. So pretty much all the structures or organs I listed above here, all of these would be considered primary sex characteristics because you were born with these. Secondary sex characteristics are sexually distinguishing features, but they develop after puberty. So for example, in males, this would include hair growth, muscular physique, a lower voice, and the development of certain scent glands that develop during puberty. In females, this would include things like a change in the body fat distribution, as well as enlarged breasts and hips that occurred during puberty. Now let's talk a little bit about embryonic development of these reproductive organs. This is something that I find extremely fascinating in looking at what causes male and female reproductive organs to develop. Before we get into that, let's look a little bit at female and male reproductive anatomy. So the diamond shaped area visible here is known as the perineum. And this is the area between the thighs containing the external genitalia as well as the anus. In the male perineum, looking over here, we can see that it contains the base of the scrotum as well as the penis. And the tip of the penis is called the glands of the penis, right here. In the female, we have the urethral opening where urine comes out as well as the opening for the vagina or the vaginal orifice, and then a third opening for the anus here. Surrounding the vagina, you also see the clitoris up here, as well as these folds surrounding the vaginal orifice. The inner folds here are called the labia minora, and this outer fold out here is called the labia majora. In both the male and female, you also see a line that go, extends from the genitalia all the way back to the anus. And you can see that here in the male as well. That line is called the perineal raphe. And it's a ridge-like seam right in the middle there. And it's actually a remnant of the two sides of the body fusing during embryonic development. One really interesting thing about male and female reproductive organs is that most of these organs develop from the same embryonic structures. This means that they have the same embryonic origin. These structures, these male and female organs that develop from the same embryonic structures are called homologous structures because, again, homo means same, meaning that they have a similar origin. Let's look at some of these homologous structures. In both males and females, we have structures that produce gametes and sex hormones. In females, these are the ovaries. In males, these are the testes. And both of these structures develop from the same embryonic structure. Another example would be the clitoris and the glands of the penis. Both of these structures contain erectile tissue that is stimulated during sexual arousal and orgasm, and both of these structures develop from the same embryonic structures. The next structure is the labia minora and the raphe, which is the ridge line visible in the penis. Both of these have a common function. They contain erectile tissue, again, that's stimulated during sexual arousal and orgasm. And both of these originate from the same embryonic origin. I'm going to show you pictures of this later on so you can kind of get a better idea of what I mean by this. And then we also have the labia majora and the scrotum. 
Both of these are homologous structures and both of these protect and cover some of the reproductive structures. And then finally, we have two organs that both secrete a lubricant during intercourse. In females, this is called the greater vestibular gland. And in males, this is called the bulbourethral gland or Cowper's gland. So what determines if these homologous structures develop into a male organ or a female organ? This is all dependent on the presence or absence of the Y chromosome as well as the presence or absence of androgens, or in other words, male sex hormones. If the Y chromosome is present and androgens are present, this will lead to the development of male sex organs. This occurs because the Y chromosome contains a sex-determining gene called the SRY gene. Without a functioning SRY gene, an individual will develop female sexual characteristics. So let's look here. So here we have the mother, she's XX. Here we have the father, he is XY. A male child will result if he gets an X from the mother and a Y chromosome from the father. A female child will result if she gets an X from the mother and an X from the father. Now, if we look at the Y chromosome here, we can see that there's a region on it called the SRY gene. This stands for sex determining region of the Y. The SRY gene, the presence of it causes the testes to form. And once the testes form, they begin producing testosterone. And this triggers the formation of male genitalia, such as the penis. So if androgens and the SRY gene are both present, we will have an individual that has male characteristics. However, if androgens and the SRY gene are absent, then that will result in an individual with female sexual characteristics. Estrogen levels are always high during pregnancy and it is not the mechanism for determining sex. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. And this is where I think it gets really interesting. So the fetus is sexually undifferentiated until about week six of development. So at week six of development, if you look at them anatomically, internally and externally, you cannot tell whether that individual is male or female. However, around six weeks of development, the SRY gene will start to be expressed on the Y chromosome. And this will start causing changes in the development of these homologous structures. So let's look at the development of the internal sex organs because these are what develop first. This is controlled by the presence or absence of the SRY gene. If the SRY gene is absent, so that individual does not have a Y chromosome, for example, then they will develop into a female. And if you look here, this is what, how they kind of start off structurally, anatomically. And if the SRY gene is absent, this green tube here, will start to degenerate. And the purple tube that you see up here will start to form into the uterus and the uterine tubes here. This little orange and blue ball here will develop into the ovaries. However, if the SRY gene is present, then you're gonna see a difference in the development. Instead of the green tubes degenerating, the purple tubes will degenerate and the green tubes will stick around. These little orange and blue balls in the picture here will become the testes, and the green tubes here will become the vas deferens, which transport the sperm. Now let's look at the external sex organs, and these are gonna be controlled by the androgens. Once the testes form, they start to produce higher amounts of testosterone. And around eight weeks of development, the embryo will start to sexually differentiate externally based on the presence or absence of testosterone. So if androgens are absent, these structures that you see here externally will start to develop into female sex characteristics or female sex organs. And so you look down here, you can see that there's a couple different openings here. You can see the urethral orifice and vaginal orifice and the anus down here. This little yellow structure here, if androgens are absent, it will become the clitoris. 
The pink structure that you see here will become the labia minora or the internal flaps. And the blue structure that you see here and here will become the labia majora. However, if androgens are present, these structures are going to develop slightly differently. So this yellow structure here will become the glands of the penis or the tip of the penis. The pink structure here will actually form like a little fold or ridge and that will become the raphe, which looks like a ridge line along the penis down to the anus. And that opening in the middle here completely fuses together, as you can see. These blue structures here will actually also fuse together and create the scrotum, which will protect the testes. So from this, you can actually see how similar males and females are because the development of their sexual organs originate from very similar structures that, and they just receive different signals telling them to develop different ways. However, there are situations where these signals become swapped and then people that are genetically male will start to develop, develop female characteristics and individuals that are genetically female will start to develop male sexual characteristics. Now let's look at three relatively common reproductive disorders. The first one is called Klinefelter syndrome. This occurs in males who are born with an extra X chromosome. Now these individuals are considered genetically male because they do have a Y chromosome present, but instead of being XY, they are XXY. The extra X chromosome leads to some female sexual characteristics such as enlarged breasts, as well as widened hips. Um, they also tend to have smaller testicular size and penis size as well. Some of the biggest challenges that these individuals have to deal with is that having this genetic abnormality usually leads to infertility, so they will not be able to have children. Also, it can lead to some learning disabilities as well. This affects one in 500 to 1,000 people. And having Klinefelter syndrome can be really difficult for some individuals because of the fact that they, kn they know that they can't have children in the future. However, other than that, they can lead a very normal life. If you are interested in knowing more about what it's like to live with Klinefelter syndrome, I will put a link to one of Ryan Bergante's YouTube videos below in the description, and he talks a lot about what it's like to live personally with Klinefelter syndrome. The next reproductive disorder that we're going to look at is called androgen insensitivity syndrome or AIS. This affects two to five in a hundred thousand people. And this occurs in individuals that are genetically male. So they are XY, but they lack the functional receptors for androgens. So although they have internal testes and they produce testosterone, their body does not respond to the testosterone that they're making. This results in them developing female-like external characteristics. And you can see that in the image here. These three individuals are XY, so genetically they are male. However, the external sexual characteristics that they start to develop are um, very female-like. And this can become problematic whenever an individual is born because when they're born, a lot of times what happens is that they are categorized as female by just looking at their external genitalia. However, genetically, they're male. So this leads to um, a discrepancy in kind of how these individuals usually feel and how people categorize them from the outside. Many AIS individuals identify as intersex. And this means that they do not fit the typical definitions for male or female bodies um, because they have a combination of male and female biological characteristics. If you are interested in knowing more about what it's like to live with AIS, Pigeon Pagonis has their own channel talking about this, and I will put a link to their channel in the description below. The last disorder that I want to introduce to you is called androgen hypersecretion. This occurs in individuals that are genetically female, so their chromosome composition is XX, and it's caused by prenatal hypersecretion of androgens from the adrenal cortex. So this means 
that they are producing too much, for example, testosterone from their adrenal cortex. And if you remember, the adrenal cortex is an endocrine gland present at the right above the kidneys. This causes male-like genitalia in these females because of the homologous structures that we talked about before. So if you look here, this, although this looks like it resembles a penis, this is actually in a large clitoris. And so by having an overabundance of testosterone, the clitoris has become enlarged. Also, the labia majora have fused together, and this resembles a scrotum here. Hopefully, this demonstrates to you how similar the development of male and female reproductive organs is. And also, it demonstrates how slight variations in genetics, in the amount of hormones being produced, and also how our body responds to those hormones can lead to the development of ambiguous sexual characteristics. To learn more about the reproductive system, watch video two, which will look at male and female reproductive anatomy in more detail.